Hey what's up guys? Today I'll show you a horror film, Nightmare Cinema. Spoiler ahead, watch out and take care. The movie begins with a woman walking down a street. While arguing with a man on the phone, she notices a rundown theater called the Rialto. It is playing a movie called, The Thing in the Woods. But the surprising thing is that her name is on the marquee. Mystified, she goes to the empty auditorium to check out what show is. To her surprise, is about herself being pursued by a welder, a masked unstoppable killing machine. And then she meets her boyfriend and a policeman. While fighting against the welder, the cop, unfortunately, kills himself, dying miserably. Woman flees with her boyfriend, and takes refuge at a guy's house. Shortly after they meet up, the welder also arrives, and throws the axe at the friend, injuring him. Enraged, the friend charges against the welder, only to be stabbed badly. What is worse, woman's boyfriend tries to shoot welder, but the bullet goes off to kill their friend instead. Woman visits the basement to search for whatever deadly tools, to wipe out the welder. To her shock, the basement is filled up with many rotten corpses. Back upstairs, her boyfriend and the killer are still struggling with one another. Soon after, the killer is gaining an upper hand, and he sadistically nails the boyfriend onto the wall. The woman quickly returns to the battlefield, upon hearing her boyfriend screams. Armed with the iron chain, the woman hits the welder really hard. Even though she is physically weaker, she has fought with all her mind and strength. At one moment, the woman is almost strangled to death by the iron chain. But she manages to overcome and knocks down the welder. When she is about to slay him, Welder removes his mask, revealing himself to be an acquaintance of woman. He explains that he was once chased by a gigantic spider at a party. At that time, the mask falls on him, and shields him from the spider's bites. Unfortunately, his other friends are all invaded by the spider. That is why he begins to slaughter them one by one, purporting to destroy the spider within them. Woman breaks down in this story, and she does not want to be controlled by the spider, so she then requests the welder to kill her, but too many spiders appear in the end. It is unlikely for the spider killer to survive the disaster. Sometime later, a couple gradually find themselves starring in the movie itself. This time around, the pretty girlfriend nicknamed Pretty, is a facially scarred woman, who feels troubled about it. But her handsome fiancé nicknamed Handsome, is a gentleman, who loves her so much that he cares little about her blemish. Knowing that Pretty is very concerned with her slight disfigurement on her cheek, Handsome generously offers pre-wedding plastic surgery to soothe her insecurities. In addition, Handsome tells her that his own mom also underwent a plastic surgery. So the mom gives her full support for the idea, and there is nothing else to worry about. Convinced by his promises, Pretty finally agrees to get a touch-up. She wants to become prettier, so that she will be more confident before her fiancé. Apart from fixing her scar, the surgeon advises her to take up other treatments to beautify her nose and chin. Pretty wonders if she has gone too far in the pursuit of beauty. But she finally gives the surgeon's plan a go-ahead. After the surgery, the nurse gladly informs Pretty that all goes smoothly. At this time, her head is fully bandaged, making her look like a mummy. Handsome takes a few snapshots of her in sleep, and blasts them out to other friends. Afterward, the surgeon comes to speak with Pretty, telling her that the operation on her nose is a little bumpy, but he assures Pretty that the minor mistake will be repaired the next morning, and she will look all good. That night, Pretty wants to make a call, but the nurse denies her request. She asks for a mirror to check her current look, but even this is not allowed. At midnight, Pretty gets up secretly, and sneaks out of the ward. She stumbles along the hallway to approach the reception counter. During the nurse's absence, she skims through her medical record from the computer, and realizes that the doctor lies to her, with this, she speculates that Handsome's sinister motives behind the whole thing. However, not until she fully investigates the matter, the lift is moving up, signaling the return of Nurse. Pretty flees the counter in shock, and hears someone calling for help at a doorstep. She opens the door to enter the room, only to find a patient without limbs. In terror, Pretty escapes the hospital, but she is captured at the end. When Pretty awakens, the mirror is placed on the table beside her sick bay, Removing the bandage, Pretty is freaked out by her ugly and monstrous look after the transformation. Needless to say, such a tragedy is orchestrated by Handsome. At the end of the show, Pretty turns around to find herself alone in the theater. Unknowingly, Handsome is gone without a trace. As Pretty wanders around, she is met with the projectionist, an indeterminately aged hipster guy, shirtless under an unzipped leather jacket. He introduces himself as a death collector, and lets her know that the scene she just watched is her own death story. 
Unable to cope with such a shocking truth, Pretty cries out loud, bringing the second horror story to an end. The third visitor lured into the mysterious cinema is a priest. His show has taken place in a Catholic boarding school, where a male student is about to jump off the high building. In order to stop the boy from committing suicide, a nun goes to the rooftop. When the boy is about to hold nun's hand, he is pushed backward to fall behind, plunging to the floor. All the witnesses, especially his peers, are held in terror. At night, as nun is writing something, the cross on the wall suddenly collapses. Meanwhile, there are strange sounds outside her room, leading her to go check out. But she soon detours due to some mysterious and incomprehensible phenomenon, as they are hiding from the public. The noises out there heighten their anxiety. They venture outside to take a look, and discover a pool of blood on the church floor. Comes next day, a compassionate girl nicknamed Compassionate, offers condolence to the deceased boy, by offering a prayer, but she is bullied by other schoolmates. To retaliate, Compassionate shovers a bully, and surprisingly throws her flying up. As the bully drops down to the ground, Nun rushes to care for her, only to find a big demon standing behind Compassionate. That night the ghost of a dead boy shows up at the church, in the appearance of a demon-possessed zombie. He alerts priest and nun that someone from the congregation is possessed by a demon, and they must purge the evil. Of course, Compassionate comes to their mind, as soon as they hear such a scary news. So priest conducts an exorcism on Compassionate, aiming to drive out the demon within her. The ceremony is interrupted by Compassionate's mom who is inhabited by the devil. By now, priest and nun realize that the troublemaker is Compassionate's mom instead. But it is already too late to take any actions, because the mom silently seizes control of all the boarding students. By the time priest and nun go to the dormitory, some students start to behave strangely. Priest and nun immediately run away, but the students gone berserk with demonic possessions, are attacking them with knives. At last, Compassion's mom reaches the rooftop of the church building. Nun follows her up to save her, but the two of them fall off the building together. The demon comes out from the mom's body, and attaches itself to Nun. So Priest is left to fight against the demon-possessed students, until the last moment of his life. When the movie finishes, Priest turns back to gaze at Projectionist, and dies of his deadly strike. A brown-haired lady nicknamed Brown, is the next unsuspecting patron to enter the auditorium, and watches a movie based on her deepest fears playing on the screen. As the show unfolds itself, she is waiting for a doctor's appointment with two sons. It turns out that two days ago, Brown's husband abandons her, leaving trauma on her. She starts to feel that everything around her is undergoing a drastic change. When she finally meets the therapist, she tells him her status is not sound, and her two sons escort her to the hospital. The therapist does not make any comment, and just leaves for his meeting after answering a phone call. Brown also exits the doctor's office, only to realize her sons are missing. As she continues walking, she finds the debris and dirt pile up in the clinic, which is rather weird and creepy. When she wonders where her kids are, there come some noises from the washroom. So she proceeds to the washroom to see what is there. It is nothing much but a plumber fixing the pipes. Since her sons are nowhere to be found, Brown asks the man if he has any idea. When there is no reply, she desperately takes out the pistol hidden in her bag. Even under such a threat, the plumber does not answer any of her inquiries. Helpless, Brown makes a call to her ex-husband, to enlist his help to find their children. However, her husband says that they do not raise any children at all. Breaking down, Brown points the gun at herself, and is about to pull the trigger. In a pinch, she hears the cries of her sons. That gives rise to her hope, so she painstakingly moves close to the door, where shadows of the sons are seen. Opening the door, she sees her sons together with the therapist. However, to her disbelief, the therapist awakens her that whatever she sees and hears, is merely a hallucination. There is nothing he can do to stop her from seeing or hearing things, the only solution is for her to commit suicide. Furious, Brown shoots the unhelpful therapist dead, and brings her sons away from the crime scene. Following the end of her movie, Brown looks at her handbag, and takes out a pistol to do exactly what the therapist says. The fifth segment of the Nightmare Cinema centers around a hippie-style music prodigy. Prodigy is a renowned pianist, and his show begins with him playing his own music on the piano. His parents are proudly looking at him among the audience. After the performance, the family of three are about to drive home. Little do they expect a murderer to be hidden in the car. Poor Prodigy has to witness his parents, gunned down in front of him by the killer. Prodigy flees the car to escape the assault, but he is shot and left for dead. 
he awakens again in the hospital to see bizarre things around them. The patients beside him are trying to run away from the hospital, and he even sees his mother, who should have died. But all this is just a dream he has during a seven-minute cardiac arrest on the operating table. It is certain that his parents are killed, while being transferred to another ward, Prodigy again sees his parents, but he keeps it to himself. That night the murderer infiltrates Prodigy's ward. Just when he is about to annihilate Prodigy, a nurse drops by. As he is holding a boutique of flowers in his hand, the nurse mistakes him as some acquaintance of Prodigy, and asks him to come back tomorrow. At midnight, Prodigy gets up again, and bumps into a braided hair girl nicknamed Braided. With spiritual eyes open to see ghosts, they are able to see dead people, because both of them had been hovering on the edge of death. The next morning, Prodigy dreams of his mother, and she wants to put him to death. Fortunately, Braided visits Prodigy in time to prevent such tragedy from taking place. Upon Braided's return to her own ward, Prodigy's mother appears to assassinate her. Comes evening, the murderer again sneaks into Prodigy's ward, and pushes Prodigy against the wall. As the murderer trips over something and falls down, Prodigy evades the ward. What is worse, even the nurses stationed outside are already killed. For security reasons, he ventures into the morgue, where he finds Braided's corpse, and chooses to lie down together with her. The trick works as the murderer cannot detect him. After the murderer leaves, Prodigy comes out of the morgue. Soon after, the murderer discovers him and tightly grips his neck, intent on strangling him to death. Just as he is about to suffocate, he has a vision of his dead mother and Braided. In the end, encouraged by Braided, he wipes out the killer with a wooden rod. After the screening, Prodigy cannot recover from it for a long time, and then the projectionist strolls in, to let him know the meaning of the movie. He further shows him the people whose lives had been taken. In terror, Prodigy tries to escape the thumb of projectionist, but to no avail. This is Daniel CC Movie Channel. Peace out.